Good evening and welcome. Tonight we will be going over the history and geography of Anambra State in Nigeria. As you can see on my map here, Anambra is located in the southern or southeastern part of Nigeria, which is primarily an Igbo-dominated region. The Igbo being one of the major ethnic groups of Nigeria. There are many. There are hundreds. But um, the Igbo are very important in Nigeria's history. It's also located along the Niger River. You can see here one of the big powerful rivers of Africa. You have the Nile, you have the Congo, you have the Niger. It flows out just south of Anambra into the Niger River Delta, out into the um, Sea of Guinea and the, the Bight of Biafra. This is very important for Anambra, especially in the past, like, 15 years or so. Because there is a lot, lot, lot of oil down here. And Anambra has slowly become an oil-producing and refining state. It's brought lots of industry, infrastructure, and just money. But, besides the oil, apparently the soil is important too, not just the oil, the soil. Evidently, 100% of Anambra's soil is arable, meaning you can plant a farm anywhere in Anambra. There are lots of different things that are farmed here, but probably the most culturally important thing is yams, or we say sweet potatoes in America, but they say yams. If you've read the novel Things Fall Apart, the author Chinua Achebe is from Anambra State, and based a lot of the culture in the main village the book takes place in on the towns and cities of Anambra. Mainly um, his birth town, which is not on here, it's Ogidi, but also the towns of Onitsha, which has bloomed into a big, big city here on the Niger River, and the capital of Anambra, which is Oka. It's a really good book. You should read it if you haven't. It's really thought-provoking, and there's a lot of yams in it. I read it in high school. I had a really eccentric English teacher, and she gave us really bizarre projects to tie in to our books. And our project for Things Fall Apart was to go out and buy a yam, and then we made Mr. Potato Heads of the characters in the books out of the yam. It was really fun. But, um, yeah, really good book, I should say. Anambra is really the heartland of the Igbo culture, to be honest. It all kind of stemmed out from this region out, spread out. We've talked about Abia and Akwaibo down here, other Igbo dominated states, but this is where Igbo culture really truly begins. So let's talk about that. There's been some really interesting archaeological discoveries in the town of Igbo Uku, which is kind of up in here. It's still a flourishing town today with the cultures and practices that they've been observing for hundreds of years, but in the past, what, 20, 
30 years or so, they've been uncovering sites from the 9th century CE and finding these spectacular bronze statues, ornaments, things like that. And Nigeria is a little bit infamous for its remarkable bronzes. There's the Benin bronzes and the, uh, the Ife um, statues. But these are something else. These look almost like modern art. They're really something. There are lots of um, kind of almost ball shaped with like coils around it. It's really truly beautiful. Um, hopefully I'll show you some pictures later on when I pull up Google Earth. But it's in that town of Igbo Uku that the kingdom of Nri began. The kingdom of Nri is probably the oldest Igbo kingdom. And I should state that there are lots of different Igbo, I guess, monarchs, you should say. Same with the Yoruba cultures over here. They call them Obas. They're pretty much like regional princes in a way. Igbo culture has that very much still nowadays, but it's mostly ceremonial. They don't hold any real political power. But the Kingdom of Greece, where it all began for those Igbo ruling peoples. Let me tell you about it. It's a really interesting story. The Kingdom of Nri was very, very different from many other African kingdoms in this region of West Africa, in that they were entirely nonviolent. They built up their population by taking in escaped slaves and other peoples who needed a safe harbor who were fleeing from something, you know. And they never went to war. They didn't have an army. And even their king wasn't quite a king. It was more like a priest figure. It reminds me a lot of the Dalai Lama. That, you know, the Dalai Lama is a ruler, but he's not a king, you know. It's a very, very important figure. The, the rulers of the Nri, I think it was called the Eri or Eri? Eri? I didn't write it down. Um, they would be selected as children once a boy would start showing the proper signs and everything lined up in their traditions. They would, you know, take him in, do lots of different initiations, and he would become their new king. And he would reign until he would die, and then about a year or so later, they would find another boy that would fit all of the qualifications and just repeat. So it was not a hereditary lineage. Again, like the Dalai Lama. It reminds me a lot of the Dalai Lama. This would change a bit over time, especially once the British started to move into the region and absorbed this area into the British Protectorate of South Nigeria. At first, the British saw all of these different tribal leaders and kings and princes and obas over here and said, well, we'll incorporate them. We'll make them pretty much like employees and um, they'll collect taxes and just to make sure everything is all good in the region. But that would slowly change as Nigeria moved from a protectorate to a colony and things started to get political and the British had to come in and be like, well, now you guys don't hold any actual power and if you oppose that, then you need to get out. And the kingdom of Nuri was obviously different, right? It was a more special circumstance and they realized that their king was not a king, he was more of a, a holy priest figure. So they thought, well, we've got to get him out of here because we're not just bringing government and democracy, we're bringing Christianity as well. So we can't have all those spiritual, traditional things happening. So 
they went to the king and said, you gotta go. So he went up in front of his village and said, listen, it's time for me to step down. I'm not going off to live in exile. We need to change our ways. We need to follow these new rulers. You know, everything the British wanted him to say, you know. And he left the village. And then about a year or so later, a boy met all the qualifications and they initiated him and made him their king. And they've been doing that ever since. It's still going. There is still a king there that does all of the sacred things that they would do since so, 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 so long ago. Since I think the 900s, 1000s, a long time ago. They have a long record. Especially since, you know, they would be initiated as boys, so they would reign for like 80, 90 years, you know. So it's still ongoing. They're still doing their thing, which I think is really special. I'm glad that the British didn't really truly get under their skin and force them to completely abandon their own traditions. I think it's neat that it's still there. Not so neat thing that happened in this region in history is the Nigerian Civil War, or the Biafran War, as it is called. So I said before that the dominant ethnic group of this region is the Igbo. The most dominant ethnic group over here is the Yoruba. And up north we have the Hausa and various Fulani groups. The Hausas are Muslim, the Yorubas are mainly Christian, and Igbos are, for the most part, more indigenous, right? There's lots of aspects of Christianity in their culture at this point. They're definitely more Christian than Muslim, but they're definitely more indigenous than Christian. So three very different groups that wind up vying for power over an independent Nigeria because each ethnic group has issues that they want addressed at the forefront of politics. And it really turned into Yoruba versus Hausa. And the Ingbo over here, feeling very unseen and unrepresented, said, we're going to form our own state. It's going to be Biafra. It constituted chunk of Cameroon as well. What's now Cameroon today? And that sparked a civil war. And uh, in Anambra in particular, it was very, very bad. The worst aspect, in my opinion, of the Biafran War was the effect it had on the civilians and the intense, horrifying famine that befell the people here. Number was one of the worst affected. Lots of aid would be flown in. They even built an airstrip in Anambra to accommodate for aid flights. But it was very, very dire, and the Biafran rebels pretty much had to surrender, otherwise, they were all going to starve. So that was the Biafran. The state was created in 1991. It was part of Inugu, I believe, before that. They separated it. And then it was about the mid-2000s when crude oil was discovered here. And uh, drilling and extracting began and refining as well. And now things are looking very positive for a number, economically don't really agree with oil drilling nowadays, to be honest. I feel like um, we should be looking for more environmentally friendly ways to power our cars and homes and things. But the upside is that Anambra's economy is better than it ever has been. So, you know, there's a positive and negative to oil drilling. It's made Nigeria an extremely wealthy country. But with 
that being said, let me grab my tablet and I'm going to show you some sights of the light of the nation. Every Nigerian state has a little nickname or slogan. It's really like we have that in America too. The numbers is the light of the nation. Here we go. So let me zoom out so you can see exactly where we are in the world if you're not quite sure where Nigeria is. Here is northern Africa. You can see the big Sahara Desert here. So we're nowhere near the Sahara. We're down in the, just past the Sahel, into the more rainforest tropical region of Africa. So here's West Africa, and there's Nigeria. And there's a number. You can see the big Niger River flowing in and creating this big marshy landscape here in a number. Look at all these islands that it creates. I imagine that the islands come and go with the tide and the flow of the river, except for big ones like that. And it's along here that we have the big city of Onitsha. Onitsha is the birthplace of the first president of Nigeria. I wonder if I can find his mausoleum, his tomb. They have a big building for not that's okay, but usually it pops up. Um, but yeah, just a fun fact. Uh, the first president of Nigeria was born here, and he is buried here somewhere. Somewhere around here. Do, do, do. All kinds of churches and mosques pop. The Google Earth slideshows in Nigeria are so lacking. Every state I've done in Nigeria, I've come up pretty dry in trying to show you things. Here's the capital of Alka. I don't think there are any good pictures here either. Yeah, just a busy, bustling African city. There was not much to show you, but we need to check out some archaeology. Actually, I think there might be a museum here in Elko, if I recall. If not, then there's definitely one up in Ipoku. Yeah, let me go look. Ipoku. Of course, the town's not popping up. It's somewhere up here. Ipo. I'm guessing this is it. No, that's not it. <laughs> okay. Well, before I look up that, I have another thing queued up here to show you. And it is the Opunike Cave. Uh, one of the many sacred caves in Nigeria, and this is the most sacred one in the state. Can't see much from above. But, um, big old cave complex, and there's lots of rules you have to follow. Um, you are duty-bound to pay for the upkeep of the cave. Only cave manager and assistants are authorized to operate the cave. Uh, you cannot be on your menstrual period. You can't steal within or around the cave. Obviously, you can't cut anything down. All items of sacrifice must be dropped in the Olgba River. And no fighting. 5,000 Nigerian dollars if you fight. You also, um, I was reading about it, you can't be, you can't wear shoes in or around the cave. You have to be barefoot. Lots of sacred rules, but I'm sure there are rules that have been put in place for, you know, hundreds of years. And you're supposed to go into the sacred river here like these lovely women are doing. And there's a point where warm water comes out of the cave and meets the cold water of the river and um, you can feel the the waters coming together there 
That seems pretty neat. Alright, let's find E full. Oops, oops if I typed it right. Eeg po uku. Let's go. Oh, I was way off. It's in the south. My bad. There's the museum. And here's an example of these incredible bronzes. Look at this. I wish I could... Google Earth won't let me zoom in anymore. Absolutely stunning. This looks like it could have been made today, right? So, so beautiful. Ooh, big cool statue of a guy. Lots of little trinkets. It's yummy food. Lots of yummy food. I don't think I've looked at this slide. Some modern art, too. Love it. Look at the museum. Big statue there. Department of Arts and Culture in the upper state of Nigeria. Most of the, well, look at this, my goodness. Most of the artifacts found around here are in um, Lagos, I want to say, the museum there. Look how intricate. So incredible that they can cast all of that. The big beautiful walls here, the complex. All kinds of little crafts that they made. Some, I guess, drawings and photographs of what things were like before. It's really, truly remarkable. Some statues as well. Some cowrie shells that they used as currency in many, many parts of Africa. They really knew how to work with that bronze. With their clothes would have looked like incredible. Lots of jewelry and things, headpieces. Very, very remarkable. And I believe that's all that I have for you today. If you want to play around on Google Earth, let me know if you find any other cool stuff to look at. I don't know what it is about Nigerian pictures on Google Earth, but they're always very If you enjoyed this style of content, please consider subscribing. This is an ongoing series on my channel. Next, we're going to be hopping over to Peru, where we're going to see some even more old and beautiful archaeological sites. So be sure to subscribe so you won't miss out. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have